But you take your Bibles and meet me at Psalm 24 this morning. As we continue in our summer in the Psalms series, we've been doing this. This is our third year going through this. And I invite you to stand as we honor His Word together. Psalm 24. And this is the Word of the Lord. A Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. This is God's Word. You may be seated. So this morning, not only are we going through summer, the Summer in the Psalms series, and we're hitting on Psalm 24, but also this is the morning where we observe the Lord's Supper as a body of believers. And I'm very thankful that we have these object lessons to remind us of all that Christ accomplished for us on, on our behalf, the, the body, the broken body that He endured upon the cross, and the shed blood, which it says numerous times in the New Testament that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That, this is, that, that Jesus Christ came to give His life so that we may have life. And so as we look at this passage of Scripture, we are noticing a, a number of things right away that um, we need to be reminded of. Every so often I keep hearing about how our religion and how Christianity is ultimately a personal religion. And by and large, I would agree with that. I would agree that God deals with each and every one of us specifically. We had a 201 class this morning, which was a class for those who have just joined our church, and it's a way for us to be reminded that we're all a part of the body of Christ, and that God has uniquely given us, by the one Spirit, that God has uniquely given to us gifts. And He's given to us certain gifts, and those gifts are in a certain proportion. And that we must be careful not to look at someone else and say, wow, I wish I had their gift. Or if you have the same gift, you're looking at someone else, wow, I wish I, I, wish I had that gift in the measure that they do. And there's this inferiority or this superiority that comes alongside us that ends up dividing us. Really what this is talking about is the corporate nature of worship. The moment that we are saved, we're not only sent on a mission, but we now become a part of a family. And I love it whenever people begin to ask me, you know, or I begin to ask people rather, what's a word that you think about when you think about your church? And invariably, the, the most represented um, description is that of family. And we better cultivate that, especially in our post-COVID world where there are some that are still a little concerned about getting back because of various reasons, legitimate reasons, are concerned about getting back and, and, and what all that means and the, the safety measures and such. I, all I know is, is that we are meant to be together. And we're meant, to, we're meant to be together to make much of Jesus, and that is what this, this psalm is about. This psalm is not only about our aspect of corporate worship where we are meant to be together, but ultimately this song is a messianic psalm, meaning that this is a psalm that is making a prophecy about the Messiah that was to come. In fact, this was talked about as, as a psalm of David. This was talked about 1,000 years before Jesus Christ came. See, this is all part of one story. It's not 66 different stories talking about 66 different things. This is one book, one story, one author about one salvation, about one Savior who came to rescue His people from their sins. That's why we are here this morning. That's what this corporate worship is all about. And let's see who this Christ, who is the King of glory, what this, what this is all about. And the first thing that we see in verses 1 and 2 is that this is His world. This is His world. 
No blanks for you this morning. You're welcome, by the way. But no, no. But th- this is one of those things where well, there's this old hymn. This is my father's world. And it was, but as we read through the scripture, this is all. This is the triune God's world. They all had an aspect of creation, and that's what we're seeing here: is that everything in this world is God's by virtue of what we read in Genesis one one. In the beginning, if you know it, say it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made everything. I believe this is one of those things where the more, the more we let that soak in, the more than some of the things that we may be hearing in our schools that everything was just a happy little accident. That's not what is happening here. There is too much complexity that's happening in this world for this to not have been made by an intelligent being. And we believe and we know that this is the God that is mentioned here in the Bible. Abraham Kuyper He was a philosopher from a long time ago, and he said, There is not one square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine. Everything that's in the universe is His by virtue of the fact that He is that agent of creation. Now, what we see in this passage here is that God is most certainly, at this point in time, tied to the temple. He is tied to the Jerusalem, but he is continually telling us and continually reminding us that he will be spreading his glory always out to the nations, not just the general aspect of creation, but the special aspect of his redemptive and salvific work. He is working and moving to bring things to everywhere. And what is happening here is that it is a reminder to the to those of the Jewish nation, a reminder to us that God is not simply a tribalistic or a nationalistic type of God to where he is only extending his particular favor, especially in our day, to one particular nation. He is spreading his glory throughout all creation. It's a reminder for us. When I, one time I went to Trinidad and I met another American missionary, and he wasn't, a, he wasn't among the Southern Baptist tribe like we are, in case you didn't know. We're part of the Southern Baptist Convention. He was part of the, uh, the Independent Baptist um, denomination movement that was there. And I had a chance to talk to him for about four or five minutes, and uh, we, we shared similarities in the gospel and, and what that's, what that's all about and wanting to reach the world. So I began to ask some of the other Trinidadians that were there that knew a little bit about it, and I asked them, "So, what do you think of what do you think of this missionary that's there? What, how, how are things going?" He's like, "Well, one of the things is we love the gospel that he's bringing, but he's also trying to make us Americans. He's trying, you know, we, we're, you know, it's it's the American furniture and it's the American songs and it's the American way. It's it's like he's he's bringing not only the gospel but he's bringing America and he's and and they reminded me as if I needed reminding. We're Trinidadians, and God has called us to reach and to be in the context of Trinidadians. We have to also remember it with our international mission board is that whenever there is someone from our churches that feels called to reach the nations, they go to the international, they go to the learning center rather of the International Mission Board, and they're not only taught how to teach the Bible better, but they're also taught about the context by which they are going into those particular areas. We're not called we're called to bring the gospel, but we're called to bring the gospel into those particular contexts. And this is what God is telling us is that He is going to reach the entire world. For His glory. In those particular contexts that's, that's being said here, we have to remember that this is a warning. Um, uh, Dean and Sarah, I mentioned to you last week that he mentioned that many Christians do not struggle between um, the choice between heaven and hell, but many Christians struggle between the choice of heaven and earth. We love earth. We really have worked hard to develop our own life. We may even tell Christ before he comes back, please don't come back before the honeymoon. Please don't come back before we graduate. Please don't come back before my kids are out of the house. Please don't do this. And we we put these things on him, and we have to just remember that we can't love earth so much that we're putting the things of Christ off. Remember in Acts 2? In Acts 2, when when all the nations are coming to worship, what is... What is Jesus doing there? What was the Spirit doing and leading the people to do? He was leading the people to speak. As the apostles were speaking, they were hearing the message, how? In the Hebrew language? In the Greek language? Or in their own language? 
This is God all the way back from the first great commission that we see in Genesis 12, where he's talking about to go from this nation to a land that I will show you so that through you, Abraham, all nations will be blessed through your people. Why? Not just because they're, they're that, that particular people, but because of the message of the saving work of God's glory that's going to go through all of the nations. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. He founded it upon the seas. He established it upon the rivers. Remember the Jews were not seafaring people. So he's like even out there. Not just here. Even out there. We see this. Well here's, here's the second one. There's more to it than that. This is his worship. There is a worship that God is calling his people to go through. And sometimes we end up looking at the wrong places to find out what worship should be. What does the world want, we ask? What does the world want in order to be able to reach the world? Sometimes we want to use the world's tactics to reach the world. Well, where, where, where is the Scriptures in all of this? Has God not provided us enough information to know what worship should look like? Worship that pleases Him? Yes, it, it is there. And so the question is, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Remember, regardless of what direction you were coming from when you were going to um, do a pilgrimage to the, to, to the temple, it was always up. When, when we think of up, we look at a map, and what do we think we're going up there? What are we thinking? We're thinking north. Well, I'm going down there. I'm going back east. We're coming out west. We have this understanding, this vocabulary that can betray us when we think, who shall, who, shall stand, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? We're not talking about that everybody was coming from the south going north. Mount Zion was where the temple was, and everybody, regardless of that direction, would go up. It was also a way of protection from enemies as well. Hard to climb and traverse that hill, but they did. And what he's saying is, who shall do this? Who is going to be able to stand in the presence of the Lord is the question. Now, if you look at how the temple is laid out, you know, the temple is laid out to where the Jews, the, the, the descendants of Abraham, they would be in that close court, and then the Gentiles and the women would be in those outer courts. Not so now, but that was the case then for various and sundry reasons. But now, how are we going to be able to be in the presence of God? I don't know how much we think about that. I don't really, because I think that sometimes we utilize the word grace to set the bar so low in our lives and in our worship that we think that as long as we show up and warm a seat, well, why shouldn't God be happy? But there's more to our lives and our worship than just this amount of time and that geographical spot that you're occupying right now, isn't there? There's more to it. Our worship is a lifestyle. Every, if everything in the universe God says is mine, then everything in our lives God is saying is mine. There's not anything that we're going to be able to pull back and say, I want this. We wouldn't want to because we see what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. We see the depths that Christ went through. But what, Well, let's find out how we can be in the presence of the Lord. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. This is God commanding his people toward holiness. This is a primary characteristic of God in, in Isaiah 6 when um, Isaiah was standing and, and he was kneeling before the throne. The angels, the seraphim, the attendants of the Lord, they didn't say love, 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 or just, 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 or good, 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 although those are part of his characteristics. But what did they say? Holy, holy, holy. And the way that we would say that now is, he's the holiest. That trisagion. The, whenever there is something that's mentioned three times, that is a superlative. He is the holiest. And he's called his people, his church, not to be good enough in this, but to walk in holiness. Jesus even said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Feeling good so far about how you're able to approach the things of God? All you have to do is be perfect. What about 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16? As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. He's quoting Leviticus 19, 2. 
Feeling good right now? So all you have to do in order to get into the presence of God is to be perfect and to be holy. R.C. Sproul says that the holiness of God affects every aspect of our lives. Economics, politics, athletics, romance, everything with which we are involved. In order for you to be able to approach the living God, you on your own have to be have a character, and your actions have to be holy and pure. You feeling good about your stance before the Lord right now? Well, there's more. It talks about how who does not lift up his soul to what is false. So this is talking about idolatry. So idolatry, a definition of idolatry is loving God, or love, we're called to love God rather than to worship what is false. Idolatry, let's get that in the right order. Idolatry is when you are loving something else as God or loving something else in the replacement of God or loving something else where God is not first and foremost. You feeling good about uh, your idolatry stance right now? Because aren't there times when we may love something more than God? We may love ourselves and more than what God's called us to do. We may love the world more than what God has called us to do in the world that we may love our flesh, that we may love anything. See, this is idolatry. And it doesn't have to be the fact of where you're taking a piece of wood and you're crafting eyes and noses and mouths and saying, you know, I, I worship you. It can be an idea. It can be a possession. It can be a sports team. Hello. It can be all sorts of things that are happening in our lives that bump things up to where we gear our entire lives around that idea, our entire lives around that activity, our entire lives about something rather than the things of God. Colossians 3 verses 5 and 6 says that we are to put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. So not only are we to be pure, if we're not pure, it's because of those things that the wrath of God is going to be coming on the earth. Feeling good about your situation right now? Isaiah 44, verses 12 to 17, there's a, there's a bit of a, it, it would be comical if it wouldn't be so sad. In Isaiah 44, verses 12 to 17, listen to the flow of what Isaiah is saying to his people. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line and he marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes part of it and he warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half of it he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. And he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down and worships it. And he prays to it and says, says, deliver me, you are my God. Did you follow the flow of the argument? There is this piece of wood that's being made, and over half of it, he's using it to warm a fire to be, so he can eat and be warmed. And with that other piece of wood, he's crafting it into a God, and he's saying, I worship you, deliver me. Do you see the absurdity of what's happening there? Is that we are taking a possession that is supposed to really serve us, and we begin to serve it. And doesn't that idolatry begin to work its way into so many different areas? Maybe our idol is having enough money for us to be able to retire or having enough money, um, I don't know where I got this from, being able to have enough money to send, oh, four kids off to school. Who knows? You, you begin to have, the, have these things or, you know, pastors sometimes have an idol of numbers or a certain amount of money in the bank that makes us feel better about things. And that's our, that's our metric And what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that we're not looking at simply earthly things to be able to find value and meaning and purpose that can only be done. 
by the one who has come to rescue us from our sin and brokenness. Jesus Christ is the only one that can provide those answers and provide those and, and, and deal with those issues. But we tend to look at other places to be able to find those things. And he's saying, no, don't do that. If you have clean hands and a pure heart, you lift up your soul to what is false. Oh, and don't swear, don't swear deceitfully to each other. What, what is that talking about? You're taking care of each other. You're not, it's not talking about profanity, although that is a problem. What it's talking about is don't swear and make a promise about something and on the inside you're like, I'm not going to do that. Oh, I'll pray for you. Do we do that? Maybe one of the ways that we can quit doing that is to pray for them right then. Don't say, I'll pray for you. Can we pray right now? There, there's lots of ways, both big and small. And that's why all through Proverbs, there's this, there's this uh, understanding of you know, weights and measures. Make sure that your weights and measures are correct. Why? That's just a basic way for you to walk in integrity integrity that's what it is proverbs 4 25 to 27 let your eyes look directly forward and let your gaze be straight before you ponder the path of your feet then all your ways will be sure do not swerve to the right or to the left turn your foot away from evil stay the end of proverbs beginning of matt perry stay on the path that god has called you to walk don't veer to the right don't veer to the left you stay on what the path that God has called you to stay on. And then you'll have blessing and righteousness. Now here's the thing. If you are reading this from a human standpoint, this has to be some of the most discouraging verses in all of the Bible. Because what it's saying here is this. If you keep clean, if you stay pure, if you don't have any mark of idolatry in your life, if you are walking in full, if, you know, if you don't fall, walk in full integrity, actually, if you do walk in full integrity, then you'll receive the blessing of the Lord. That's what it says. You'll receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation, such as the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. And then you see that little word there, Selah. Now, I remember the first time I came across really Sela or paid attention to it, it was, a, it was a Christian band in the 1990s, I believe, Sela. Very, they're a good band. I'm like, I wonder where they got that from. Well, here it is in the Psalms. And what it is, it's a meditation. It's, it, instead of us moving, we tend to want to move, even in our worship services. We've got to get it moving. I see the clock. I hate clocks sometimes. Clocks are a pain sometimes. Because why rush God? Why rush His Word? What, do you, what, what's, what, what better thing to do? Right? So, as we get into this, such is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. But as we get into this third part, we're going to see how it informs the second part that we just went through. Because number three, this is His worth. He is worthy. Andrew Peterson, I think Chris Tomlin did it as well, this song, you know, is he worthy? He is. He is worthy. And as, and as the, the, the congregation is there around the temple, now they're, it's like they're in this type of corporate worship where you have the leader saying something, the crowd is saying something, and the leader, and it's kind of like this antiphonal response, this back and forth call and respond type of deal. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. And that's the corporate aspect. Well, the leader is now saying this. Well, who is this king of glory? And they respond back, the Lord, strong and mighty. We sang it earlier. The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. And there we go back. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The leader is saying, the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Now, I've looked at my calendar. We're on June 27th. I know this is not Palm Sunday. But this is a Palm Sunday text. Hosanna! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna means Lord save us. Oh. So what, what happened was the Pharisees a thousand years later who knew this passage and knew it was messianic and knew it was about the king of glory coming in. The king of glory was coming in. 
Yes, he was coming in on a donkey. That was prophesied as well. But he was coming in on a donkey. And what did they do? Did they react in the way that the Scriptures called them to react when the King of Glory was coming in? No. And one day the King of Glory is going to return. And are we going to react like that? Are we going to be like, oh man, like we talked about earlier, oh, not now. Please. But what's happening here? Well, what hap- what's happening here is there is this bleakness. This, th- there is a sadness that's here because when you know the story of how the Pharisees reacted and how they couldn't give anything about Christ coming in, Jesus quoted to them Mark 29, 13. This was a few pa- uh, uh, chapters back in, in Mark 7. And he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy to you hypocrites as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. You know what? Sometimes I read this and think, oh, those Pharisees, how could they? And then I read this and think, oh, my goodness. Are there aspects of traditions of men that I'm holding to, and I may be putting the Bible on the back burner? And why? Why do I do that? Why do we do that? No, we've got to be people of the Bible. We've got to be people of the Word. We have to see what's happened. Now, how does this affect, as I mentioned earlier, verses 3 to 6? If it's up to us to be saved, we go verses 3, 4, and 5, and then the blessing will come. Oh, you were able to be obedient. You could do it since you were able to do it in the fullest. Since there was never a time when you didn't have clean hands or a pure heart and your character was always pristine. Since there was a time that you never worshipped anything else or put God on the back burner. Since there was a time when you never did anything wrong to your neighbor in thought, in speech, or in action. When you do that, you can be saved. How many of us in this room would be able to fulfill that and to do that? Not anyone in the history of anything except for one is this able to be done. You can't do it. Even love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Can we do that for any amount of time? Are you with me? No. See, God is not calling us to holiness, and God is not saying... God is not giving us this blank check of grace to say you can act however you want. It doesn't matter because one day you punch that ticket and you're going to heaven and such. What God is calling us to do is to be people of holiness. Why? Because His Son dwells in us. His Holy Spirit dwells in us. And there should be no desire for anything else to be mixed in. When I was... uh, we went off to a youth conference, and every so often, I've, I've shared this, but it's been a long time, but every so often we would go off to a youth conference with our youth when I was a youth pastor, they would bring up sometimes these illustrations that the youth would actually love, and one of the illustrations was, suppose you had this big bowl, and it was all of clean water, except for one drop where you take a dropper and you went over to a toilet, and you pulled that in the syringe, and you took that water from the toilet, and it would just be one drop, just one drop, big bowl. The ratio was still pretty good. One drop, would you drink out of that bowl? And of course, they'd be like, no. Well, that's what happens when we willingly allow things of unholiness to, inter- to, to infiltrate our minds and our hearts. But when it comes to Jesus... Jesus works it back. Jesus works it from verses 5 and then 4 and 3. What do I mean? How do we receive blessing from the Lord? Well, we can't receive it, but Christ did it on our behalf. At the cross and at the empty tomb, Jesus took all of those things, not only that we did, but all of those requirements that we were supposed to do, And he did that on our behalf. So we receive his blessing, verse 5. We receive his righteousness. And then by the Holy Spirit, as we are already Christians, he begins to work that holiness in us. So Jesus is working it back for us. We couldn't do it. Who is this king of glory? 
Christ is the King of glory. And Christ is the one that answers the questions in verse 3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? The only one qualified to do that is Jesus Christ, the King of glory. But because of what he did upon the cross, everybody, and what he did when he was raised from the dead, now we can be with him. We are his and he is ours and all that he accomplished for us is ours and it's ours toward our account. This is this King of glory. And I pray that this glory is something that you recognize and that you understand all that he has accomplished. I want to close with just a quick quote from a guy named Kevin Van Hooser. He wrote a book called Hearers and Doers. And he said, To take and read and preach the Bible in church with an ear for the Word of God to the people of God is to read it as a testimony to Christ, His person and work, His suffering and glory. To read the Bible in church with faith is to read it as a divinely authored, unified story about God's attempt to bless all nations through the seed of Abraham by forming a multi-ethnic family to be his own treasured possession, a people incorporated in his Son through the Holy Spirit. Take, read the whole Bible. Come and see how it is all about Christ. So yeah, Psalm 24. A thousand years before Jesus entered, a thousand years before he entered into the temple as that king of glory was prophesied here, we're reading it and we're being reminded. If this is the qualifications for us being able to go to heaven as we read verses 3, 4, and 5, we're sunk. And if that's what you believe, you're sunk. That's not nice. No, that's, that's nice. That's really nice. That is, that is being your best friend right now. You're sunk if you believe that you have to get yourself right in order for Jesus to love you. That will never happen. But Jesus already took all of that in your place. He's already shown that he loves you. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. I didn't make that up. Romans 5.8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then he works in us and moves us and convicts us of sin and shows us how to live for him because of what he has already done on our behalf. The gospel is here in Psalm 24. Who is this king of glory? Jesus. He is that king of glory. And I pray that you wouldn't leave unless Jesus is your king this morning. Heavenly Father, Thank you for this rich understanding of what Psalm 24 is. Thank you, Lord, for those that can help give understanding. And I thank you, Lord, that as we're here this morning, that our hearts and minds would be filled with the fact that Jesus is the one that took our sin and stood in our place on our behalf so that we may obtain his righteousness and blessing. We can't do it on our own. And may we... May we just eradicate that thought. May your Holy Spirit just eradicate that thought that we can do it on our own and you'll come alongside and and fix the rest. Lord, we need to be relying on you, square one, point one, right at the beginning, right at the trailhead, Lord. We need to be relying on you every step of the way to be able to climb and to ascend your holy hill. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that this would be the morning that he would be their King of glory. He is the King of glory, but that they would receive it. They would acknowledge it. They would recognize their brokenness before him, but that he rescued us from that brokenness through the bloody cross and the empty tomb. And Father, if there are those here who are followers of Jesus, Father, I pray that you would give us in our will a desire to be holy, that there would be nothing in us that is not of you, that would remain in us, that we would be willing by your Holy Spirit to have all of that kicked out so that we may be holy before you. Thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you for all that you've done on our behalf. May we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen.